Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me for my comic book review for books that came out this week in April 2013. I want to thank you all for joining me. And uh, yeah, I'm still going through. We're still in the beginning stages here. I'm still in a little bit of hot water with you with YouTube. So I'm still doing my my main reviews on my Blue Goblin X channel. So thank you for uh, tuning in. All right, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine books to cover here, and in my opinion, this was a damn good week for comics. I mean, damn good week, so good. In fact, I really, really had a tough time narrowing it down to which one would be my pick of the week. And I got it, but it was really close. I mean, just really close. I mean, a lot of these books are going to share the same scores as the pick of the week, but it's just, wow, great week for books. We're going to start with DC, go through Independent, and then we're going to end with Marvel. Starting off DC with Batman, The Dark Knight, number 19, The Guardian of Gotham City, faces his ultimate failure I don't know how well y'all can see that um, it's Ethan Van Skyver uh, work on the uh, cover but who did the uh, main art here the main art was um, size Simon Kudransky I probably butchered that name and I'm sorry uh, but Greg Hurwitz keeps doing the writing here this is the continuation of the story involving the Mad Hatter and <whistles> wow this the Mad Hatter is one sick bastard I'm like this was really dark the artwork was gritty but you know the storytelling still sell. I don't think this was as as electrifying as the last issue was, but this was still pretty sick. Um, uh, Bruce is coming to terms with uh, something that he did in the last issue that I stupidly forgot to mention. Uh, last issue, he he had a he has um, he has a girlfriend now. And in the last issue, I believe it was in the last issue, yeah, he confessed something big to her. Something really big to her. Yeah, she to uh, he told her everything. He he's Batman. And I love the dialogue in here concerning the, the continuation of that part of the plot. And she's like, I guess Alfred is probably regretting. And he says, are you kidding? Alfred's probably jumping for joy that he's got somebody else to talk to about what he does. You know, this is just really good stuff in here. But the main selling point is the Mad Hatter. And we get more, we get even more detail into his backstory, into his origin as to how he came to be. 
and we are seeing even more side effects of the steroids or the 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 medication that he's taking and something else that I didn't really point out that well is that his parents are trying to help him they're trying to support him say hey look we we know it's something you want to do but we're against you taking these pills because they could hurt you and everything it's nice to see that uh, Jervis's parents weren't neglectful or abusive or anything like that they actually tried to help him and everything and uh, it's just he's just going he's just going nuts from this medis from this from these pills that he's taking and something else that goes really crazy in here is that he's found a, a new Alice mmm not gonna ruin it not gonna ruin that I'm not gonna ruin who it is but he goes through a rehearsal for this upcoming new Alice and it's just it, it paints a picture as to how how much of a bastard the Mad Hatter is and the oh my god the cliffhanger the the the, the cliffhanger at the end of the issue damn <laughs> damn oh wow awesome read don't think, in my opinion, it wasn't as great as the last issue, but still a good read, a solid read. Mad Hatter is really creepy, really psychotic, and I mean, I'm digging this Mad Hatter. Uh, great storytelling from DC, Batman the Dark Knight, number 19. Alright, next up we got The Flash, number 19. His Greatest Tragedy at the hands of reverse flash oh yeah I saw that and I was ready to read this I like the fact that they didn't jump right into reverse flash right off the bat even though I was kinda of pissed when they revealed reverse flash earlier in the series and then they didn't follow up on it at all but here they're gonna finally follow up on it which is good but this really, um, I believe this also crossed over with uh, the Dial H series, which I don't read and I don't buy, so I didn't follow it. But in here, some crooks and some criminals are trying to break Trickster out of jail. And Barry has to stop them without his powers, without his speed powers. He's just Barry Allen. And it's, it's it, DC lets you know that really well. There's, hold on, let me find it here. It's, the, it's like... DC Comics proudly presents Barry Allen <laughs> instead of the Flash. It's this issue of Barry. It's it's like an issue of Barry Allen <laughs> featuring the Flash. I just thought that was a nice touch, reminding us that he doesn't have his powers. But what he does is that he stops these crooks and criminals from breaking out the trickster using the Rogue's weapons, and it's really it, this reminds us just how smart Barry is and he's his techniques and his tactics that he goes through to stop these criminals and everything very very nicely done and he also makes a realization that everybody except for Iris West ex except for Iris everybody who went through the speed force got powers or you know speed related powers primarily his friend Albert who is sadly the victim on the cover here calls himself the turbocharger and he's able to you know, I guess turbocharge any weapon or, you know, maybe, you know, I guess you could use the term pimp them out or, you know, amplify them or something like that, you know, really beef them up and everything. And it's really, really nice. Uh, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to ruin how Barry gets his powers back. I'm not going to ruin what, what causes that, but he does get his powers back. And one thing I will spoil is the cliffhanger. The cliffhanger is basically what you see on the cover what you see on the cover is what you get at the end of the book it's like we're not getting ready for reverse flash just yet we're gonna keep teasing it this issue was to resolve uh, Barry's problem with not having his powers 
and it was slowly building up to the moment where we're finally going to get ready to go with the reverse flash. So, all in all, this was a great read. Very nicely done. Um, uh, Brian Buscelletto and uh, Francis Manipool do, both do the writing on here, and they both did a phenomenal job. Great stuff. I, I, I loved it. Great read, and I'm just chomping at the bits, ready to go. Where's When are we going to get this? Flash on reverse flash fighting. Come on, give us the reverse flash. But, um, yeah, really, really nice. And I must say, I'm digging the, the new 52 look for reverse flash. That's just me. All right, next up. Red Lanterns, number 19. Sworn to slay their greatest enemy. Their own leader? Yep. The, the cliffhanger at the last issue and the beginning of this issue shows Atrocitus carrying out an order to everyone in the Red Lantern Corps. Your next target is Atrocitus. He puts a hit out on himself. And I'm, you're, I'm sitting here reading this thinking, how does that make any sense? I mean, yeah, the, the first Lantern messed with him previously saying okay you could have stopped the the massacre but he chose not to stop it and he believes himself responsible for it now and so he must die okay what this basically was was the red lanterns unleashing all their rage on atrocities and instead of killing him here's a swerve it makes him stronger it's like and i guess you can say you they did kill atrocities but now he is reborn with as a new Atrocitus with even with more powerful rage than ever before. And then again, you know, I'm thinking to myself, kind of a cop out, but it was good storytelling. I did like the action in here. The artwork was in good detail. This is part twelve of Wrath from Everybody Except the First Lantern. Uh, there was plenty of wrath in here, but it just wasn't from the first lantern, obviously. We're probably not going to get any wrath from him, you know, save for the moment of... Except for the part where he destroyed Sinestro's home planet. That was the only wrathful moment he's had in this entire story. Like I said before, besides that one moment... I mean, one moment in 12 parts so far... And so far, we're, we're part 12 of this story, and we've only had one moment of wrath. Sure, it was a big moment, but it was only one. I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe we're going to get wrath going around everywhere at the conclusion, and Jeff Johns and everybody at DC is going to make us think it was all worth it when it's probably not going to be. Especially since we're going to have to pay eight bucks for the damn conclusion. Um, but this was a great read. I really enjoyed it. I liked seeing the rebirth of Atrocitus. And the ending is leading up toward the conclusion. I liked it. I, I'd say pick it up. If you're a Red Lanterns fan, you won't be disappointed. This was really good. A little simple, but still really good. Time for the pick of the week. And... Oh, there were so many. There were so many books that could have easily been the pick of the week, but this made it. I had to stick to my guns and just pick one book to be the pick of the week. And the pick of the week comes from IDW, and it is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number twenty-one. You damn right. Kevin Eastman not only does the writing, but he does the interior artwork. And granted. I did, I loved the artwork for the turtle story involving the neutrinos. That artwork was fantastic. But I felt really nostalgic seeing Kevin Eastman, one of the guys who invented the Ninja Turtles, along with Peter Laird. I, like, I really enjoyed seeing Kevin Eastman doing the artwork for his creation. It was very nice. Very well done. I love the artwork. But let's talk about the story. Alright. The story. It's simple. 
This kind of story has been done before, but Jesus, I loved it. It was great. This really paints a picture for the for the turtle's character. Very, very well done. Uh, an, an, an assassin uh, confronts the turtles in this book, and he's really arrogant, cocky as hell. He is basically smacking the turtles around like, like he could do it with his eyes closed or one hand tied behind, whatever kind of cliche arrogance you want to use. I mean, this guy is just literally, he's smacking them around and he's gloating at them while he's doing it. And the turtles can't seem to lay one fucking finger on him. And what's worse, he says, now that I've dealt with you, I'm going to find your master and I'm going to kill him. Yeah, and they're like, no, that's our father, you know, and this really, this really shows, this really paints the loyalty of the turtles to Splinter. What they're willing to do, what they're w willing to go through to protect him, they're willing to to risk their lives or maybe even sacrifice their lives in order to protect him, and that's really, really a great strong trait that the turtles have, a strong bond that they have with Splinter. It's really admirable. It's really refreshing to see that trait remind uh, to see Kevin Eastman remind us of that great character trait that the turtles have, and. It's like, with all of that, he this assassin is still smacking them around, still still cackling and laughing and gloating about it. But then, when it all comes down to it, the assassin reveals who he is, and I'm not going to ruin it. Even though you probably already know, there's probably a lot of people who don't know what it is or haven't read this book yet, and... Out of respect, I'm not going to spoil it. Damn good storytelling. Damn good swerve, even though it was kind of predictable. Did enjoy it. And the cliffhanger at the end of the issue involving Shredder and the Foot Clan, all I'm going to say is, whoa. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> oh, God. IEW, you hit a home run with this. This was great. One of the best issues of the turtles that I've read and that I've read so far, and hell, this is coming off. This is this is starting off after the the awesome neutrino story. Just fucking incredible. I loved it. Get do us a favor. Get this issue. Jump on board with the Ninja Turtles. It's not too late. You can. This right here is the is a perfect jumping on point for this series. Great stuff. I loved it. All right, now we're going on to Marvel. A lot of good stuff from Marvel. We're going to start with Guardians of the Galaxy, issue number two. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis. I don't, Bendis, I don't know what you're smoking, man, but I'd like to have some because what you're going through at Marvel right now, you're writing so many books, but... This time around, you're writing so many books and you're doing it well. You're doing a great job with what you've got. I've been I've been loving your Uncanny X-Men stuff. I've loved your Ultimate Spider-Man stuff. I'm loving this. You know, uh, just awesome stuff. And as if that wasn't awesome enough, you got Steve McNiven on the artwork along with Sarah Pacelli. Damn! How much more star power can you get? For this series, this was this was a good read. This was really good. This is this what this basically is was it was the Guardians uh, protecting the Earth from the um, from the invasion of oh shit I just blanked the 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 name of the 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 alien invaders who who are invading London. Um, the Badoon. The Badoon. Okay. The Badoon are invading the Earth and they're hitting London. And the Guardians are simply protecting the protecting our planet. And they're doing a great job with it. And they got a pretty pretty damn risky yet uh, 
Well, it's it's a bit of a ballsy plan. Instead of hitting each individual ship as a group, they they split up. Each member takes one ship. Pretty ballsy, but they know how to work together and they have good they have good chemistry with each other and they really do pull it off. I'm loving Gamora. That's all I'm going to say. Chris, my student, my brother, you were right. I'm falling in love. I'm falling in love with this character, Gamora. Damn, she's awesome. And on the other end of the story, you got Star Lord's dad, the king, meeting with all these cosmic, you know, people. You know, you got the supreme intelligence of the Kree. You got the gladiator, the leader of the Shi'ar, the All Mother of Asgardia. You know. Every, he's meeting with every known celestial person you can think of or cosmic person or whatever whatever term you want to use but basically saying something that we've already known from the last issue that the earth is off limits and the cliffhanger reassured us of something we learned in the first issue or you know last issue is that the guardians were basically set up the king Put a, put a no-touch policy on the Earth. The Earth gets invaded. The Guardians protect it. And then the Guardians get arrested. They were set up. That's what I'm going with. I think Star-Lord's bastard father set them up out of his, you know, because he's being a real arrogant prick. So That's what I'm getting from him so far. But it's just... This is just phenomenal stuff. I loved every bit of it. And there was a line in here. It's like, the communications are down. And they can't get in touch with the, the Avengers, the X-Men, or anybody. They said, don't you have, isn't there, aren't there British X-Men in here? And Iron Man's like, well, did we have Captain Britain? And they're like, is he any good? And he's like, no, not really. I'm, like, I'm sure that pissed off a lot of Captain Britain fans out there. But... <laughs> I loved it. This was great stuff. And I know I probably spoiled the hell out of it, but I want to get this series, I want to help get this series through the roof. I want to help get this series more popularity because I think it deserves it. It is so well done. I can't really say a bad thing about this book. I really can't. Awesome. All right, moving along. This also could have been a pick of the week for me. All the power, none of the responsibility. Scarlet Spider number 16. I loved this book. I really did. Chris Yost, gotta give you credit. This book was incredible. Uh, let me check and see who did the artwork. Who did the artwork? Koi Pham did the, uh, did the uh, penciling. And I'll give him credit here too. The artwork was really good. Uh, not exactly an original cover, but I'll take it. Now, why did I love this book so much? Because finally, we're back to to the element that made this series that made me love this series from the beginning. This was a fun read. There was really no big dire consequences there was no big dramatic overdone cliffhanger there was no rip off of a J. Michael Straczynski story called The Other there was no demons from hell or none of that shit you know, there was no drama from Carnage or anything like that even though that's even though Minimum Carnage kicked ass this right here we're going back to the basics and what going back to what made me fall in love with this series I had fun reading this book Kane and his buddies that he's got in Houston they go to a rodeo and they're just like and he's just like got somebody kill me I can't believe I'm here why am I here oh god I want to die you know and he's like, and his and there's you know Annabelle Adams she uh, and all I could say oh hell I'm gonna go ahead and show you because I, I, I got I got I got to I got to 
Um, get a look at Annabelle if you can. Ow! <laughs> yeah! And she's like, runs up the cane. She's like, I'm so glad you're here. And he's like, well, that makes one of us. And you just want to, oh, God, you fucking prick. But he is just so oblivious. He, he just, he, he's just, he, he can't help but be brutally honest. And he just, he doesn't stop and think that some of the shit he says could hurt people's feelings. And he doesn't realize that. And it's, you know, as heartbreaking as it looks, it's also kind of funny. And the, uh, his friends even point that out. He's like, how can you be that stupid? You, do you not understand that you probably just hurt her feelings or something like that? And I'm like, wow. But there's a big there's a big to-do in the rodeo involving um, the, uh, the armadillo, uh, who is a former member of the Texas team from the Initiative. And there's like a... It's like he's causing carnage and breaking stuff and trampling here and there, all because of a simple little misunderstanding that gets easily resolved just minutes later. And um, and there's a a bit of an awe moment for Kane. He finally gets the girl. He finally gets the girl. I'll go ahead and show you. Oh hell, the the glare from the light's not gonna right up there. He's got a love interest now. He's got somebody to fight for. That's awesome. I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. I've always been a sucker for the for that old cliche, the hero gets the girl in the end. I've I've always loved that. It it makes you it makes me the reader get even more emotionally connected to the character because now this character's got someone to fight for and someone to come back to when he or she is done with what they with what they have to do out there in the hero world. It's great stuff. I never get tired of that. That's why I loved Spider-Man and Mary Jane's marriage. It's because he had somebody to love. He had somebody to spend his life with. Somebody to fight for, defend for, somebody to die for. He had, And he had somebody to come home to when he got done with his heroics. I love that cliche. I love it. And I don't know why comic book some comic book companies or some people who work in the comic book industry seem to hate that, which is retarded. Uh and I, I uh okay, I probably shouldn't have just said that. I'll say that's idiotic. Okay, I apologize for the R word, I really do. But this was fun. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. And I'm telling Marvel and Mr. Yost now, give us more issues like this. Give us more stories that go like this, that flow like this. I'm just having a blast with this. Good stuff. Good, good stuff. All right, moving along. Uncanny Avengers. Number seven. Get a look at that cover. That, um, what does this look like? Bald guy with an arrow going down his forehead. He must be an airbender. <laughs> I had to. I had to go there. Okay. Um, Rick Remender and Akuna. Okay, with a pretty damn good John Cassidy cover. I do like that cover. Um, this was this was pretty good. I, I really I I I don't have any really big complaints about the book. It's just minor nitpicks in here, and I'm like, I just I'm still not sold. I, I love Alex Summers. I love the character Havoc. In fact, you know that's my student, the Mount Vernon kid. That's his favorite Summers brother, and I respect that. But. In this issue, I'm still not getting that vibe that he could be a great leader because uh, Rogue gets thrown under the bus for what she did to Grim Reaper, and instead of standing up for her, Alex basically just says, "Okay, you know, there's like they have, uh, you know, they they tell him here, you might have to do this or do this or do this with Rogue, and he's just like, okay, okay." 
I'm like, if you, it's like, I just feel like he should have at least tried because it. I didn't see it in here, but he should have at least tried to vouch for Rogue and stand up for her. Instead, he just, he just, he just kind of sold out and just went, oh, okay, okay, you, you want us to give her a desk job? We'll give her a desk job. Okay, you got it. You know, I'm like. Rogue had every reason. Rogue had every right to be pissed off in this book, and it wasn't covered in here. Nobody covered it, but this is this is how I feel. And he should have stood up for her, at least, even if he wasn't, even if he stood up for her and said, "No, I'm not going to bench her," or "No, I'm not going to give her a desk job as you want," or anything like that. And even if he failed, he could have said if he, he could have said he at least tried, but he didn't even try. Or um, I don't know, but. That was my only really big complaint in here. Well, my nitpick, as I should say. That and Janet kind of... Wasp. She kind of... I don't know. It's Her dialogue in here and the way she acts, it just kind of... I kind of didn't agree with it. You know, it's like her, she even used the term gnarly. Who the fuck says gnarly anymore? God, that... That dialogue is extremely dated. It's like the last time I heard the word gnarly was in the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie back in 1990. Yeah. And I see it in here. What the fuck ever. But what really sells this book is the story involving the Apocalypse Twins and their assault against Apocalypse's son and we get to see the Apocalypse Twins kill a Celestial. Holy shit. And the ending was so good. The, the cliffhanger was really good. Thor, at the very end of the book, once Thor realizes what happened and how the Celestial was killed, he instantly knew he fucked up. It was something he did a long time ago. Now, I'm not going to ruin the details as to what that means, but all I'm going to say is Odin was right. That's all I'm going to say. This was a good read. It does have flaws for me, but I still but even though I just described what those flaws are, I did enjoy reading it. I, that's just me. Alright, moving along. We got Uncanny X-Men, number five. Bendis. Jesus. Love this stuff. Uh, Frazier Irving does the artwork in here. The artwork in here... Uh, it's, it's good. It's good. But there are parts where you feel like, did he draw everything in here? Because there's there's some solid parts, and then there's some kind of gritty parts. You know, especially with um, the underworld. Uh, this this whole issue basically deals with Ileana. Deals with Magique. And something's going wrong up here with her. And she's actually pulled down into the underworld or into limbo or whatever. And she's actually talking smack to Dormammu. I mean, she is talking smack to him. She's she's like, what the hell do you want, Dormammu? She's like, go away before I smack you or something like that. It's like, <coughs> damn. I mean, Ileana may be a girl, but she's got some balls on her. You know, I'm like, to stand there. She's still basically a child, but, you know, she's going to stand there and stand up for herself and talk smack to somebody like Dormammu and then we get to see some big reveals in here concerning Ileana and this is basically the shit hitting the fan for for Dick Summers and his team of X-Men this was good this was really good I'm not gonna say anything else about it I just think this is this is a this is an uncanny X-Men series I think is well worth reading because it really gets you pumped. I mean, if you if you read this book and you hate Scott Summers even more, 
it's more a reason to keep reading because it keeps you gripped it keeps you entertained it makes you want to read more so you can hate him more or so maybe you can understand his logic more or whatever for whatever reason this series has been constantly well worth reading bendis i don't know what's going on in your head man but i hope you keep it up there because you're doing a great job uh, uh, that's all i'm going to say uncanny x-men number five do yourself a favor and pick it up i think you'll like it all right we're going to end this review with Jason Aaron's Wolverine and the X-Men number 28. This is the uh, conclusion of Wolverine and his his students on Savage Land concerning his, do his brother, Dog Logan. This is the conclusion of it. Um, Perez's artwork, uh, yeah, Ramon Perez, his artwork in here was, it's getting better for me. It's getting better, um, but then again, you know, it's not perfect. I've seen better artwork, but I really liked this. I really thought this was a strong conclusion. I thought it wrapped everything up pretty nicely. Uh, you know, we get to see some real cojones from Wolverine. You know, he's, he finally catches up with his students and with Dog, and he says, Hey, Dog, I don't want to fight you. You're my brother. I'm not going to hurt you. And he retracts his claws, and Dog just beats the living shit out of him. What sells this book is Logan's, you know, Wolverine's students finally stand up together as a team, and they, they come through for Wolverine. They really do. Uh, and there's a really badass moment with the uh, with the eye guy or uh, eye boy. I, be, I don't uh, let me get the name right. Eye boy. Yeah, there's a, eye boy has a really badass moment in here. I loved it. That was my favorite part of the book. Uh, there's some good dialogue from Shark Girl in here. I really enjoyed this. And Logan after after dog and everything he transported to this point to this island he transports them away and the students all look at Wolverine and he's thinking to himself you're right you have every right to hate me because you didn't fail I failed and he's they're going back to the school and Wolverine's basically thinking they they have every right to hate me for what I put them through but I failed them and I wouldn't really blame them if they actually do hate me. You know, and it's, you really got to feel for the guy, and he's he's trying to help these kids. With all the shit he's going through, he's trying to change himself. He's trying to help these kids. And for Dog, it doesn't end well. Uh, it's just... Uh, the ending, it wasn't a cliffhanger, but the ending of the book just made, you just, just made me just facepalm and just... Oh, damn it. It's one of those kinds of endings where, yeah, he came in looking like the villain, the strong bully type villain who believes that there's something that heroes can, that people should not be using powers, they should be using guns and stuff. And he, you expect him to, you know, he's had this really, you know, this badass vibe to him. And you see him in the end and you're just like, oh, damn it. <laughs> good stuff I really enjoyed this book uh, it's not perfect as I said before but this series is still has still been a very enjoyable read I I loved it I thought it was I thought it was good for what it was and I think you would be too Wolverine and the X-Men 28 yeah I I'd, I'd recommend it all right thanks uh, I want to thank you all for watching this obviously unrehearsed uh, review here ladies and gentlemen um, I want to thank you again for your patience for having to come on my Blue Goblin X channel and watch these reviews uh, subscribe to Blue Goblin X please it's now is the prop now is the perfect time to do that but don't forget about my main channel I'm still gonna be doing stuff on there don't forget about me on Twitter or on tumblr and please don't forget about my student the Mount Verdon kid all of his channels don't forget about Dark Avenger Inc plus follow them on Facebook uh, 
Thanks so much for watching, everybody. And until next time, I will see you all later.